I think when I did a, one of those career tests, I think they said I should work in a brewery. So we're all about building products that come right from our customers' needs. Um, but more recently, going out for investment, a lot of it has come down to actually finding people who share our vision and finding people who are genuinely as excited about what we're doing as we are. Because I think that's what really counts is when you get people who buy into you know, the kind of the idea of, of kind of making self-employment simple for people, it's for them it's not just about a return on investment, it's about actually going out and making a real change to a market that is desperately in need of it. So we're very much about finding founder-friendly investors who want to come on that journey with us, not the ones that are just looking to make a quick buck. I would say the first thing would be to go out and speak to customers first, or your potential customers, before you do anything. You know, sometimes you pretend you have a product and you sit down and you say, you know, we've got this thing, are you interested? And you know, you'll very soon find out whether or not what you have is something that people want. And all too often people go down the road of building something and, and investing sort of financially and, and potentially in their own time to, to create something quite big, and that's when they find out the customers don't actually want it. So yeah, the first thing is, is kind of go out and, and really engage with your audience first. And I think secondly, the second thing is actually just go out and start. There's no, uh, there's no greater kind of sense of learning that comes from actually just, just doing it and getting out there and, and putting yourself out there. And as I say, New Zealand's one of those countries where it's one of the most receptive to small businesses. Um, word of mouth counts for a lot in New Zealand. So that the sooner you get out and start engaging with the market and start kind of putting yourself out there, the more success you'll have. I think all too often people kind of try and wait until something's perfect before they put it out the door. But, um, but really, you know, New Zealand's one of those countries where you can just get out and do it. Uh, I spent the next 25 minutes, half an hour, not too much of your time, just talking a little bit about kind of reflecting on self-employment a little Being bit. self-employed, as, as I'm assuming most of you are, um, Self-employment has not changed in about 50 years. So this is what Wellington looked like when banks and government agencies started to look at self-employment. So back then, being self-employed was actually relatively rare. Most people would get a job at a company for you know, a career. And if you were out on your own, you probably started a business. You probably you know, ran a shop, you probably ran something like a, a, a small number of employees. You actually had a small business. But being out as an independent contractor was a bit of a rarity back then. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't particularly usual. And what that meant was that <clears throat> tax around being independent was actually pretty simple. Um, you know, essentially, you had a tax rate, you worked out how much you earned, you paid it. That seems like a pretty simple system to me. The problem is things started to get really complex very, very quickly. As more and more people got into self-employment, IRD had to worry about things like student loans or and deductions and provisional tax. And suddenly, we got to a point where our simple tax system for the self-employed had just become this burdensome uh, trawl through sort of crazy calculations and lots of legislation. And that's where these chaps come in, and chapettes. Um, accountants. So it soon came to the point where you had to employ a professional with years of experience just to navigate the tax for an individual which is crazy when you think about it. You can go and get a permanent job and you can have all of your tax sorted straight away. But for some reason, doing a similar job but as an independent, you needed a firm full of people and you needed people who could navigate all of those tax codes and go through everything. And we, we flash forward to today and there's an entire industry built up around accounting, accountancy, accounting software. It's cheap, <coughs> particularly in Wellington with our friend Zero down the road there. Um, but it's a bit out of kilter that you can't just go out and earn as an individual without either having to learn everything yourself or go and see some of these people. It's a very different world from where it first started, where actually self-employment used to be such a simple thing. Um, and those things, those things have changed significantly if you look at the kind of way we're working as self-employed people today. Um, Uber, for instance. All Uber drivers are self-employed, mostly because Uber doesn't want the overhead of employing people. Um, but not just Uber drivers, but taxi drivers in general. They are all self-employed individuals. They are all responsible for their own tax, for their own compliance. And you know they do that to varying degrees of success. 
but there are entire industries that are purely self-employed people. Um, not just because um, these people have decided to become self-employed, but you can't actually become a, a taxi driver as a permanent <coughs> member of staff. Those things don't exist. Taxi drivers, the entire industry is self-employed. Couriers, also all self-employed. You'll see the franchise drivers, sometimes they're working across two, three courier companies at once. Again, all self-employed people. Um, and these aren't people who've kind of chosen to start a business. These are just people who happen to find themselves in this industry. Um, if anyone's been down to Weta Workshop, uh, so Weta, Weta Digital, that is at least 2,000 independent contractors working between those two companies. And some of them come from overseas. And so we see that when you look at the market for self-employment, I'm assuming most people here are working in government or private sector, when I first started out as a contractor, as an independent, I just assumed that the majority of people were like me. We were all, you know, we're working with spreadsheets all day. But actually, you look at self-employment, and it is phenomenal, the number of industries that are all self-employed people. Effectively, the world of, of work, as we know it, has changed so significantly. But all of those systems and processes, and all of the tax, and all of the compliance, none of that has moved on in 50 years. So. We can't get away without talking about the gig economy. So for, for, to kind of characterize the gig economy, that's really this, this idea that individuals are out there in the world selling their services on short-term, flexible contracts. Um, so the gig economy is people selling their services or their products to multiple clients at once, maybe working across multiple industries or, or job types. Um, and we're seeing globally, we're seeing an exponential rise in the gig economy. Most people kind of go, oh, the gig economy, that'll be Uber and Airbnb. But actually, the gig economy is just self-employed people. You are all, as self-employed people, part of the gig economy. You have flexibility over where you work and who you work for. You could potentially work for multiple clients at once if you wanted to. So whilst little New Zealand down here has got 400,000 people in New Zealand are self-employed, according to MB. But you look at the global statistics and we see that in the US today, there are 10 million people who are taking advantage of self-employment. So these figures are from, the, uh, from 2016. If we look at 2020 where the predictions are at, there are going to be 50 million people in the United States that are taking advantage of self-employment in some way. And that doesn't mean they'll all be Uber drivers, but that means that they'll all be taking that flexibility of being able to work independently without having that idea of a single company and a job for life. And what this is doing is bringing this huge amount of flexibility to everyone, and opportunity. And really it's opening up the idea that you can go and be following a dream, being your own boss, um, go and work for who you want to work for without being encumbered. However, when we look at where people are working, this whole idea that Uber is the gig economy, only 16% of self-employed people are in uh, providing driving and delivery services. Actually, the vast majority Professional, creative, or administrative services. And I would wager that's most of you in this room here would fit into that category. <coughs> which is almost 60% of the self-employed workforce. Um, you are all, as I say, you're all part of that gig economy, that growing, uh, growing trend away from a single job for life. Again, we talk about tradies, skilled manual labor or personal services. All of these people, there's this massive economy that's growing up around us. And we're kind of looking at things like banks and governments that really aren't changing with the times in any way. So what's so hard about being self-employed? For those that have never been self-employed, sometimes that's a question that, that gets asked. What, what's so difficult about being self-employed? Um, and I'm sure everyone's got their own, their own stories on this, but one of the, the couple of things I want to pick up on is, um, has anyone tried getting a mortgage when you're self-employed? <laughs> That is a tough one, especially if you and your partner are both self-employed and trying to get a mortgage, trying to prove your income is difficult as a self-employed person. It's not impossible, it's just very, very difficult. You've also got planning for the future. Planning for the future, planning for where you want to go, looking at regular, uh, sort of regular income, that's all difficult things about being self-employed. Getting a loan, getting insurance, even getting professional insurance can be tough as a self-employed person. And so as a self-employed person, you have all of these this myriad of things that kind of clouds your life. You've got things like you know, dealing with maybe with accountants or banks or insurance providers and then our own ACC. Has anyone dealt with ACC recently? I'm sure that was a very enjoyable experience. <laughs> I, I remember being self-employed and 
I'll come on to this a bit later, but it's the fact that they default everyone onto a manufacturing code when you yeah. first start. <coughs> this whopping bill is if you've been working on a construction site when you've just been down at Endy. It's just, it's madness. So as a self-employed person, all of these things distance you from the stuff that you'd much rather be doing. You'd much rather be spending time with friends and family, maybe you'd rather be spending some time doing client work. But no one wants to speak to IRD. No one wants to go and uh, have to go and deal with an accountant and learn how tax works. It's just not why people got into self-employment. You probably came into it for the flexibility, for maybe following a particular path. It's just a necessary <coughs> people that's landed on your lap that you have to do this stuff. Added to that, you're expected to know everything from day one. Particularly, and no offense to momentum, but they have no responsibility to educate you on how your taxes need to work, on how your compliance responsibilities need to work. You're expected to do your own research, to find out everything you need to do straight off the bat, so that when you start working, it's expected that you've already got all the provisions in place for this kind of stuff. And we have, we have a lot of people we speak to who just had no idea when they first started. I mean, I would be one of them. No idea when I first started. I, I wanted to take a job somewhere. It happened to be a contract. They told me I needed to do things. I, I thought I'd, I'd have to find out. But you just don't know this stuff inherently, especially as someone who's been a permanent member of staff for you know, quite a few years of my career. So anyway, most people that we speak to, when they're just embarking on that first journey into self-employment, they tend to look a little bit like this. <laughs> just, what, why, what? Everything that we come across is just an inconvenience and it's something new to learn. And it's so easy to get tripped up. And so easy to come out at the end of this with fines and penalties and various other things. Now, what we found is we've done a whole lot of research on this to you know, hundreds of self-employed people. And I was surprised by this when this came back. But 35% of the people we spoke to said that they actually find it difficult doing good work for their clients because they're worried about tax. And that's everything from you know, people working in, in government jobs and office workers through to the people who drive your taxis and deliver your parcels. Your courier driver, you know, we, look, we live in an age of internet shopping and your courier driver just disappears off the map for six months. That's a huge impact to people at the actual, at the, the customer end of your, of your business. And, and I'll hold my hands up and say I got stung by ACC my first year. I had no idea that you needed to pay ACC, but you know, November or whenever it is, they just pitch up with a bill that says I've been on a construction site for 12 months and <laughs> then you have to have that argument with them over the phone and prove to them that you've not been a tradie. Um, but yeah, I got stung by that. It just, I just didn't know. You know, my, my responsibilities were to my clients. <coughs> not, I just assumed someone would, would tell me at the time that I needed to do something. Naive, I know. But a lot of people get in this situation. So how do self-employed people handle this? And I'm guessing most of you in the room will be in this situation because this is where, this was my go-to. You're going to get one of these, and then you get one of these. You get an accountant, and you get some accounting software. I went with I went with Zoho Books because it was too obvious to put zero up there. Everyone expects zero MYOB. But I went and got an accountant, and I thought that's me sorted. You know, accountants will take care of all of this problem for me. And then I started to get a little bit cynical when I realised that all my accountant was doing was some maths. And then I was doing the rest of the work. I was the one in here reconciling transactions and classifying everything and going to trade details to chase down invoices. And then this dude was just doing some numbers, most of which he pulled out of this. So I, I sort of realized I was paying for this, I was paying for this. And yet I was still there doing a lot of work myself, having to go through this whole battle with moving money around and, and you know, trying to desperately put the right money away for tax, which you tend to do as like a flat rate oh, I'll just put X percentage away, and you never quite know whether that's enough or too much, or can I dip into it, or maybe not. But most people kind of go down this road, go and get an accountant. But most of the accountants don't do a whole lot of stuff for you. They don't do ACC. Some of them may, some of them be nice enough to do it. But a lot of them don't do ACC. They can't actually make the payments for you. They can't actually do anything more than just provide some advice around the rules. And then it's kind of up to you to make your own mistakes from there. So I was in this game. I was in the big shuffle. I don't know if anyone does this, where you've got a, maybe a revolving, revolving credit mortgage and you put some money in and, and you try and offset your mortgage against your tax money and desperately try and make some money from the GST or whatever it is. Why, is anyone playing that game? Oh, yeah. No, because it's rubbish. It's a terrible game that earns you no money. You're explaining that, sure. Yeah, it's, it, it's a difficult one, right? Because what I found was, I was, uh, I was doing a lot of this shuffling, moving things between accounts, and I was trying to make money off 
things like GST, which I was paying a couple of month, every couple of months, and provisional tax was taking away the rest of my money. So it was a di di really difficult thing. People say this is going to work for them, but actually I never found that I made any money off it, and the time that I was spending doing that was effectively costing me more money. I knew how much my time was worth as a you know, contractor working in government. So this is the problem that, that, that I faced, is that there I was, shuffling money around accounts. I come from, you know, only two years prior, I was a permanent member of staff, and I was shuffling money around accounts, and it was a Sunday night, and just really got to a point when I thought, I mean, I'm a technology person, I'm, you know, I'm not an accountant or bookkeeper, I'll be the first to say that I'm not one of those. But this to me felt like a technology problem. We have a whole bunch of rules around what you can and can't do. You've got a whole bunch of stuff that I'm trying to do just to get tax paid. And really the thing I wanted to concentrate on was just going and doing good work. Like why couldn't being a self-employed person be as easy as having a permanent job? Because it should be. It shouldn't be so difficult. We shouldn't be punished or burdened as self-employed people just because we happen to go out and be self-employed. Okay, I can see if you're going out and you're running a small business and you have stock and inventory and staff, it's a very different thing. Go and, go and get zero, it's great. But if you have a permanent job, you get your, <coughs> you do good work, you get paid, you pay taxes you earn, you go home and enjoy yourself. And my, so, my, my friends who are in permanent jobs, this, this was the bit that they really enjoyed. Go home and enjoy yourself. Don't spend your evenings messing about with tax, worrying about whether or not you're going to pay the right amount or whether anyone's going to come and get you. And granted, I, was, you know, I had an accountant, but we meet a lot of people who can't go home and enjoy themselves until they've done all of their receipts. You know, you may only incur one couple of, a couple of receipts a week. Look at taxi drivers, couriers, all these other guys. They've got receipts coming in three, four, five, six times a day. And all of this has got to go somewhere. They've got to have some way of managing this. And a lot of them struggle. So that's where Henry comes in. And that's where, where idea, our idea came in probably about 18 months ago now, which is how can we make self-employment simple? How can we make it accessible, affordable, and easy for anyone to get into self-employment, regardless of how much you earn or what kind of work that you do? So I want to explain a little bit how it works. So you, you sign up for Henry, and within two minutes you have a Henry account. You have any income, any self-employed income you make paid into that Henry account, and as soon as money comes in, we automatically calculate, deduct, and pay exactly the right amount of tax based on how much you've earned. And that's income tax, GST, ACC, student loans, KiwiSaver, we can even do charitable donations at the same time. And on the same day, your money gets passed on to you, along with a pay slip. So you can go and prove income to whomever you need to go and prove that to, and you know that all of your tax has already been paid. If you need to, if you need to uh, make business expenses and get deductions at the end of the year, we calculate all that out for you and file all of your tax returns for you. So that's GST and income tax all get filed for you automatically. So the idea is by the time you get to the end of the year, just like a permanent member of staff, you have a zero tax bill. And so you can be comfortable that you never have to worry about provisional tax, you never have to hold any money back for tax, you don't need an accountant, you don't need accounting software, you just get paid into one account and on the same day your money comes through to you and it's done. Here's a pay slip, move on with your life go home and enjoy yourself. So when you're a Henry customer, you get access to our online platform, and I'll be the first to say it's super, super basic. We don't want people on it, if I'm, if I'm honest. But we don't want people reconciling transactions and falling in love with tax calculations. That's not what we're about. We want people to open something on their phone, snap an expenses receipt, and then go back to doing what they were doing. Because it's more important that you concentrate on doing good work for your clients, going and developing relationships, going and spend some time with your family, it's not important to reconcile transactions and have your own little cash book or a chart of accounts. That's, that's not how a lot of people want to work. So within Henry, it's really simple. We can have, if your recruiter doesn't, obviously some recruiters are good enough to do your invoicing, but we can handle invoicing and when we send invoices to your clients, we'll actually chase them down for payment. So you don't need to go chasing your clients down to get them to reimburse you. We do all of your tax calculations, regardless of whether that's $10 a month or $10,000 a month. We make all of the payments for you. So all of those payments I talked about before, you don't need to worry about making any of those. And because there are no provisional taxes, you don't need to worry about holding back any money. <coughs> Lastly, we file all your taxes. So what you're getting is essentially self-employment in a box. That when you come into this world, you can come in and out of self-employment as many times as you like. 
work for six months self-employed, go back to being permanent, never worry about having a tax bill that hangs over you for a couple of years, or worry about ACC pinging you the following November and saying you've been a tradie. So for this, we charge a 1% fee, and that's a 1% fee of the income that comes through your Henry account. And I'm assuming a number of people in this room may be my earners, might earn over maybe $200,000 a year, which is why we top out our fees at $2,000. Now from our research, an accountant who can only do a fraction of what Henry does might charge between 750 and we've heard horror stories of $2,500 a year for an accountant who's doing some maths and leaving all, everything else to you. So with Henry, there are three main things that we think it drives benefits for. So it's greater freedom for self-employed individuals that you never even have to think about tax anymore, which is great. Even I'm boring myself talking about tax. <laughs> You've got lower barriers to entry into the gig economy. So anyone can become self-employed and literally just jump straight in. Two minutes, got a Henry account, I can go and work for anyone doing anything. And you think about that expanding gig economy where people are, are starting to earn money in varieties of different ways. Having a very fast way of getting up and running is essential. And lastly, we're saving the government time and money. So May the 16th is when government budgets come out. And if it's anything like last year and the year before, IRD and ACC will be asking for a large chunk of your tax money to go and chase down self-employed people. And we are talking in the region of 10 to $15 million every year just to chase, chase down people who haven't paid their tax. So with Henry, this is all a thing of the past because everyone's pay as you earn. Everyone's paid up. So I want to talk a little bit about our customers. So we have 75 or 80 customers, I think, as of today all signed up. So these are people who are not self-employed because they want to run a business and they want to go and, uh, you know, they want to go and have, as I say, employees or inventory. These are photographers like Ash who want to go and actually follow their dream of going out and starting to do work that they love doing. And maybe they're doing that alongside a permanent job. Then you've got guys like James. So James is the head of 3D at Weta Workshop. Um, James, for, for, you know, and he won't mind me saying this, James is the kind of guy that ignored tax all year until two weeks before it was due. And then he would run around the house screaming, bundling all his receipts together, desperately trying to get something through to IRD in the, in the hope that no one would catch him out. And he's, he's done this for a couple of years. And it, honestly, it's, it sounds ridiculous, but he, he was so bowled over when we went and spoke to him about Henry that he signed up on the spot. Because his life had been dominated by 11 months of avoidance and then one month of just sheer panic. So I wanted to share a couple of stories about the detractors and you know, as, an, as a startup, as an organization that's kind of disrupting a lot of what traditional bookkeepers and accountants do, we have our fair share of people that haven't been friendly. Um, so accountants are a funny bunch. Um, I remember we first came out with some, some really basic social media advertising last July. And one morning, it was about half six, I got a notification on my phone that someone had given us a one-star review on Facebook. And if you're someone who believes in reviews on the internet, a one-star review is pretty shocking. So I had a look, and, uh, and it was some random. Not one of our customers, no one I'd ever heard of. So I replied, as me, and said, hey, I notice you're not a Henry customer and you've never actually been on our service. Just wondering what warrants a one-star review. And he just put three words, please call me. But no phone number, no nothing. <laughs> so as you do, I just tracked him down with LinkedIn. It's great. I found out where he worked. He worked at a small accountancy in Christchurch. I found out the number for his desk. I rang him at his office half an hour later. And I said, hi, my name's James. I'm the CEO of Henry. Just wondering what warranted our one-star review. And, oh, 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 well, um, so he gave me some lines about, uh, oh, you'll be offshoring receipts to India and the Philippines, which we don't do. And then he said, oh, well, you're just an automated system. And I said, no, we have a team of people. We have... You know, our CFO is a former audit director from Deloitte. We had Deloitte work for us to do all the calculations. Like this is a, you know, this is a very well put together business. And he, then he said, "Oh, and I love startups." It's like great. Would you like to give one a chance to succeed? So anyway, I managed to talk him to take that one star back that very morning, which was quite satisfying. When when really, you know, it was that kind of internet trolling of I'll just give him one star review because I don't like the sound of this. And we have other we had a. <laughs> We had a payroll department within uh, a large organization here in Wellington who, when they first heard about us, the, the accountants in the payroll department said, no, that's illegal. That's illegal. <laughs> so we went down, as we do, we went down, we had a conversation, we took the whole team down, and um, 
We spoke to them, and within 15 minutes, the woman who called us illegal said, this is a great idea. Would you like us to promote you internally within our organization? I said, yes, Wendy, that would, that would be lovely. That would be fantastic. But it was that whole thing of the knee-jerk reaction of some of the accountants and bookkeepers when they see parts of their market essentially being eroded is to instantly fight back. And we, you know, someone said to us the other day, we had an article come out, we got featured as a startup to watch in, in NZ Entrepreneur magazine. And this woman contacted the editor and said, we really don't think you should be publicizing services like this. Tax is tricky because it needs to be. <laughs> and the editor wrote back and he posted this to me, it was great, he posted me this little screenshot. It was just a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but he shared it with me. And he went back and said, I'm a former accountant, former construction worker, and former self-employed person, and I thoroughly disagree with what you say. Tax is overly tricky, and it doesn't need to be. And I think this is the point, that we have a number of people out there who are progressive enough to see that actually jobs like bookkeeping are really quite, uh, quite able to be done by machines, by computers, by people that can actually make some smart choices. You don't need an accountant. What you need an accountant for is financial advice, you might have a complex financial position and multiple shareholdings and directorships, and that's great. Go and get an accountant, because they can give you some great advice. But if you are an independent contractor, working, maybe working in government, maybe in private sector, even if you're a taxi driver, you do not need to hire an accountant. That is just, you know, that it's kind of wasteful. And actually, a lot of accountants don't want to be doing this work anymore. You imagine that whole shoebox full of receipts that you shove at your accountant, <laughs> where they charge you an hourly rate to sift through and tell you, they don't want to be doing that. They want to be giving you financial advice about a family trust or about what you could do with a partnership. The last thing they want to do is comb through all of these coffee receipts telling you which one you can take 50% on. So for us, when we talk about Henry, I don't know whether anyone remembers these adverts where you've got the Mac and the PC. There will always be people who want to do the tax themselves. Always. And some people will be more than comfortable with doing it and probably some people in this room are more than comfortable doing the tax themselves. That's great. But there are other people who just want this to be like a light switch. You just flick it on and you know it just works and it, it goes away. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to know the inner workings of the light switch and how all the circuits fit together because actually I'm over here with different things to do with my life. And we're kind of in this situation that we're kind of building a movement of people who realize that the days of having to configure and having to go in and do everything yourself or even have to go and you know, get an accountant and sit down with them every year to work through everything, those days are gone. Actually, we, people just want this taken away from them so they can move on. And that's, that's what we're seeing in terms of the kind of revolution that we're bringing to self-employment and the kind of people that are joining with us as customers. So what will the future of work look like? Now, I ran a workshop for IRD with a whole bunch of public sector and private sector people, there's about 50, 60 people there a few months ago now, to talk about the future of work. <coughs> so a lot of people who are in that room, they think the future of work looks like this, this kind of dark, dystopian future where, you know, this, uh, I just noticed there's a Pepsi logo there, but that's, that's nothing to do with the dark dystopian future. But um, this is why a lot of people in that room were very scared about the future. And they said, oh, there's going to be this horrible thing where everyone's going to have to find their own work, as if they don't already find their own work today. But when we look at it, we say, actually, what we're seeing is a globally distributed workforce. So new technology has meant that we don't need to just work on the shores of New Zealand now. As an individual, you can go and sell your services to other people in other countries. You can already go and get a, a go and get jobs through uh, <coughs> Fiverr. If anyone knows Fiverr, the website, you can go and actually earn money designing logos, doing brand work for people, and they are worldwide. You don't need to be confined to New Zealand. I'm granted that the little man doesn't extend to New Zealand. I do realise the irony of that. Um, but actually, what we're seeing is this idea that geographical boundaries aren't going to limit you in terms of where you can work. And what comes with that is a whole bunch of, in today's world, a whole bunch of complexity of, oh, how does the tax work and how will everything go? When you've got a pay-as-you-go service like Henry, you don't need to worry about that. We already have people who are earning overseas, who are getting payments using credit cards with Stripe, who get paid through our service, who never have to worry about this stuff. And your clients, the people you work for, they will be looking overseas as well. Because actually, they won't be limited by just a New Zealand talent pool. They'll be saying, who is the best person to bring into our organization who can help drive the outcome that we want to get to? And they may not live in New Zealand. They may live on the other side of the world, but they're willing to work remotely to make that happen. And that's part of what we see as being the gig economy, is that actually everyone is going to have the opportunity to work globally, to work remotely, and to be able to sell their services to whomever they want, whenever they want. 
And when you get to that point, you know, you're always starting to say, well, what is the what is the crux of what the future looks like? Well, for us, the future is not going to be a job for life and a company that looks after you. It's going to be things like flexible jobs, and you'll have a service like Henry to look after you, so that you can go and concentrate on doing the things that are actually important to you.